Hello and welcome to this week's edition of From Our Correspondent. A lot has been happening in our various communities and as usual, our correspondents have been roving. I will share with you their report shortly. My name is Richard Kwejenyakwe. It's always a pleasure to serve you. Welcome and be my guest for the next hour. I am Rafik Salami. In our first story, some residents in the Mampurugu Mwaduri district of the Northeast region in the course of the week took to the street to protest the rising insecurity and violence from the police in the area. The residents held placards, sticks and other objects and marched through their communities to demonstrate against frequent armed robbery attacks and kidnappings by armed men. They also demanded that the regional minister Yida Nazakari stop sleeping on his job and put urgent measures in place to address the increasing state of insecurity in the district. Correspondent Ilya Sutanko has more. The Mampurugu Mwaduri district in the northeast region is witnessing rising insecurity with armed attacks on roads leading to farms and market centers. Already, the district is said to have recorded over 15 robbery and kidnapping cases combined since the start of this year. The district which was created 10 years ago still has no established police station with less than 20 police personnel currently present in the district of over 68,000 people and covering a total land size of 2,150 square kilometers. Due to this and several other operational challenges, most of the communities in the district have been left with no option but to mobilize and take charge of their safety and protection. This was the case on the 20th of last month in the district when four armed robbers arrived on motorbikes to attack a fuel station in the Kubari community. The residents responded to the attack leading to the arrest of one of the attackers who was said to have died later and was secretly buried. In reaction to the death of the suspected robber, armed security personnel from the Regional Police Command stormed the communities on the 9th of last Saturday, June 18th. 25 people, including minors, were arrested, whilst others said they were tortured by the security personnel, leaving them with injuries. This young man is one of the victims. He is completely broken and paralyzed as he narrates his ordeal that night. They used the bat of their guns to knock my eyes repeatedly. I cried out to my mother. I said they have damaged my eyes. As my mother rushed to my rescue, they shoved her off and continued to beat me until I blacked out and was unconscious. His mother, who could not recollect her age but is believed to be over 70 years old, collaborates the narrative of her injured son. They were telling me to get inside, but I refused and told them I would rather die with my son than stand to watch them kill him. That once I rushed to save him, they would push me off and drag me to the ground. I have bruises all over my body. This 80-year-old man also claimed to have been assaulted by the police. This teacher, who had just arrived in the community to prepare his lesson for the week, says he is still in panic over what he saw. For me, I have just lost a uh, distance in policemen, or I would say some of the policemen. In fact, I do respect police people a lot, but this incident made me to just lose confidence in some of them. Because that day I was not having my phone, I was trying to capture the number of cars that they brought. Even if they are to arrest the whole Mauduri township itself, they will not bring that kind of vehicles here. The police also arrested a final year student of Yagaba Senior High School. His mother appeals for him to be released to take part in their upcoming final year examination in the school. My son is innocent and so I appeal to the police to release him immediately to join his classmates for their upcoming final year examination. The police have since released 20 people, leaving four in custody after a screening exercise was done following the arrest. The two communities had been emptied as the residents fled after the police raid. The residents upon return decided to mobilize and took to the streets in protest over the police action and their failure to provide them adequate security. They held placards calling for state protection against armed men in the area. They accused the police of doing nothing as robbers attack and loot their properties every day and demanded the unconditional release of their brothers who are still being kept in custody. Abdullahi Dambasedu spoke on behalf of the protesting residents. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, there is no major road within the district that is safe to travel, especially after 6 p.m. 
Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, irrespective of how the police behave in this matter, we the people shall continue to defend ourselves against these irresponsible criminals as the police lack the fortitude to protect us. We would also like to call on the regional minister to stop sleeping and watch over his own people. We are completely disappointed and utterly dismayed as to why and how this act <coughs> happened without the notice of our regional minister. We are, we are by this press given the regional police commander and the regional minister up to 24 hours to release four of our brothers who are still in custody over the matter yes. to facilitate the effective reconciliation between indigents and Flannies within the district. Failure to which we, the residents of Mampurgo district, will advise ourselves accordingly. From Kobori, Elias Sutanko, reporting Soda, for Joy News. Long live Mampurgo Maduri. We thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Yeah. Our second story, the paramount chief of the Paga traditional area in the Upper East region, Pe Charles Aria Awampaga, the second has celebrated his 50th anniversary on the chieftaincy scheme with a call on the people of the Upper East region to end all forms of ethnic dispute and unite in order to promote the development of the area. The week-long celebration, which was characterized by colorful displays of culture, brought together thousands of people and was graced by many dignitaries, including former President John Dramani Mahama. Upper East Regional Correspondent Abel Sorry was there and came through with this report. Pe Charles Awia Awampaga II was born on the 16th of June 1952. He was enskinned as the paramount chief of the Paga traditional area on 20th June 1972 when he was only 20 years old. 50 years on, his reign has seen the Paga paramountcy develop into one of the biggest business hubs in the Upper East region mainly because the Ghana-Burkina Faso border is situated in this town and tourist sites such as the Crocodile Ponds and the Picoro Slave Camp are also located here. The people of Paga and the rest of the Kasna Nankana West District in this month of June joined their paramount chief to begin the celebration of the Golden Jubilee of his reign. The main celebration began on the 20th of June with a Catholic mass service to pray for Pe Charles Awia Awampaga II. In attendance was former president of Ghana, John Dramani Mahama, who extolled the paramount chief of the Paga traditional area for the peaceful nature of the area during his 50-year reign. The Kasina Nankana West District Assembly with headquarters in Paga has now been created which has further boosted the decentralization drive of our local government system. In the area of politics, Pe Awampaga is one chief who has continued to respect the constitutional provisions that bars chiefs from dabbling in partisan politics. He has always been a father to all, and I and members of my party, the National Democratic Congress, shall continue to count on him as a worthy partner in development for the progress of our dear nation. The 50th anniversary celebration of the reign of the paramount chief of Paga was climaxed by a colorful deba of the chiefs and people. It was an occasion full of rich cultural displays from various ethnic groupings and attended by thousands of people. In a speech read on his behalf, the paramount chief of the Paga traditional area Pe Charles Awia Awampaga II called for an end to all forms of chieftaincy disputes in the Upper East region. However significant they may be, our achievements will always fall short of the ambitions we nurture as a people. So, on this occasion, let us pause and reflect on our sincerity and objectivity on the positive as well as the negative aspects of our action and inaction. Both tangible and intangible resources have been bequeathed unto us by nature and our ancestors. But million to us in Paga, we have our traditional buildings, monument shrines, the arts and crafts, and landmarks, including our sacred crocodiles, all of which have cultural significance. He also called on the people of Paga to be security conscious as the proximity of the town to neighboring Burkina Faso puts the country at risk of intrusion by unwanted strangers. And recently, the armed forces present an alert in Paga that has resulted in a remarkable improvement in the security profile of Paga. 
for the unfolding unfortunate events bordering on security and public safety close to us in neighboring Burkina Faso, each and every one of us must be vigilant and curious about every unfamiliar face in our vicinity. My people and I, therefore, fully subscribe to the security alert, see something, say something. The theme for the 50th anniversary celebration of the reign of the Paramount Chief of Paga was celebrating our heritage, an anchor for development in peace. Paramount Chief of the Mayoro traditional area, Pe Dr. Pakia Atudi Pari Manchi III, delivered the keynote address. What is the fidelity of our national passion, anchor on our heritage? To speak the truth, always when we are all being held spellbound by hardcore propaganda? What is the instrumentality of our culture to be progressive when our leaders do not receive candid advice from us? We all have an obligation to help, and this obligation is from our culture. Speaking on behalf of President Nana Akufuado, Upper East Regional Minister Stephen Yakubu said, Government was committed to bringing more development to the Kasna Nankana West District. History is full of examples of prosperous nations and empires that collapse under the weight of land and chieftaincy disputes, and we must be guided by this. I wish to use this platform to call on all factions in the Bakwe area, Bolokatanga and Doba, Kandiga disputes, to resort to dialogue to resolving the impasse for the region. Is our old ancestral home and must be protected. For Joy News, Albert Sorry reporting from Paga. Now it's exactly a year ago since 86 soldiers stormed the Tindamba Crescent in the Wa municipality of the Upper West region and brutalized innocent citizens and injured over a dozen of people over snag mobile phone. Although the soldiers who committed the inhumane acts not sanctioned by the military command have since been punished, including demotion and a 30-day detention by the commanding officer, the victims are yet to be compensated over the incident. Rafik Salam has more. As the sun rises in this small Tindamba crescent, the working class are not only back, but with optimism. Same time a year ago, and on a day, that the country achieved a Republican status from Great Britain, they were seen in a viral video brutalized by soldiers from the number 10 mechanized agri barracks, majority of whom have just been recruited into the service barely a month. Without the least provocation, the 86 soldiers subjected commuters and store owners on the crescent to military drills, pushing them to stagnant, dirty water infested mosquito gutters and flog them severally. The horrific and despicable act shook the nation and President Ekufu Adu a month later in a meeting with the overlord of the Wala traditional area, Nafu Senesidi Pilipo IV, could not hide his displeasure and apologized profusely to the people. So I've come to add my voice to that of the soldiers as well as the Minister for Defense to say how sorry I am about the incident and to let you know that we will do everything possible to make sure that such an incident is not repeated. Some of the victims had multiple wounds and others had fractures and had to be rushed to the hospital. I can't count how the many of them that was beating me. They was beating me quack, 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 quack. and uh, they beat me, it affected my eye. Gafur Mahama used to work at this sports betting center as a security personnel. He was flocked with horse canes, his thighs stamped on with military boots, resulting in a fracture on the thigh bone that required surgery at the Upper West Virginia Hospital. Apart from his medical bills taken care of by the Upper West Virginia Minister, the 5,000 Ghana cities cash given to him by the Parliamentary Select Committee on Interior and Defense and a token he had from an unknown officer from the number 10 mechanized agri barracks. He is yet to receive the compensation promise to enable him put soul and body together. He has now been laid off by the alphabet sports button as a result of his incapacitation and now depends on the benevolence of people to survive. I am not able to walk long. I have severe pain from my waist joint. 
when that happens, I have to sit down for several minutes for the pain to go away. The parliamentary select committee was not specific, but they told me that they would help me to have a normal life again. But up to now, I haven't heard anything from them. Another victim of the vicious attack of the young soldiers was this mobile vendor who was given a heavy slap who nearly sent him falling on the ground. I was slapped very hard that I, I was even about to fall uh, out of this container. If not because of my strong legs, I would have just fallen and just fainted. Is it affecting your work? Oh, it's still affecting me. Till now, you will never know when uh, that kind of thing will happen again. So you're always afraid. You can never know, maybe the next time that they are coming, they'll be coming with guns and all that, so you wouldn't know what will happen next. Another place where the young soldiers demonstrated callous disregard for their victims and showed no remorse was inside the shop owned by teacher Kum businessman Brigand Yahya Salifu. Brigand is still suffering from the eye and often skips school anytime the pain aggravates. Sometimes I can breathe, I find it difficult to breathe. And sometimes I cough. Last week like this, I was in class when it happened. I have to stop the class and seek permission from my boss and come home to treat it. And as I do, until now, I still feel the pain sometimes. What we only want is the compensation. Once they compensate, you will know that when you beat somebody without any reason, you should pay the price. The 86 soldiers who were involved in the Inhuman Act, not sanctioned by the military high command, has since been punished, including some of them having their ranks reduced and others handed a 30-day detention by the commanding officer. What is hard of a left now is what will assuage the pain of their victims to have a normal life again. The despicable act of July 1 may have occurred a year ago. The wounds and injuries on the bodies of the victims may have completely been healed, but the trauma of the horrible and shameful act it's still on the minds of the victims. Reporting for the news, Rafik Salam. Wa. Now, Rotary International says the quest to combat corruption in Ghana will be in vain until the citizenry is conscientized to uphold moral uprightness. The Humanitarian Service Organization believes individual integrity and good moral principles are necessary to groom a society that is empathic and guided by truth in the quest to alleviate human suffering. Club President Nana Kofia Yesubwahin says being truthful is essential in treating people equally without taking undue advantage of others. He spoke to the media after the Kumasi East members of the Rotary Club unveiled a four-way test signage in Kumasi. Mahmoud Mohamed Nouridin has more. As Rotarians of, Rotarian in, of Rotary International and as members of the Rotary Club of Kumasi East, we've gathered here to unveil what we call in Rotary circles as a four-way test signage. A four-way test is a moral code that we use as Rotarians. And as it reads, it says that of the things we think, say, or do, the first is, is it the truth? The second is, is it fair to all concerned? The third is, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And then the fourth says, will it be beneficial to all concerned? As Rotarians, we are guided by this moral code to make sure that we stand for integrity as much as possible in everything that we do. The club encourages all citizens wherever they find themselves to imbibe moral codes into their life in order to avoid being dishonest. And we also try as much as possible to encourage all citizens wherever we find ourselves to live, live by this moral code such that if there is integrity in everything that we do, as citizens and as a nation. A lot of social vices and other issues of corruption and other things that are going on as we find ourselves now 
will either be named in the bad or will be a thing of the past. In that, if somebody is not saying the truth, we know the implications and the consequences. Is the person judging by his or her, him or by herself, going to make sure that what he or he, that person is saying at that particular point in time going to affect somebody positively or negatively? According to Mr. Ayesubahene, the club's activities include working tirelessly with relevant agencies to eradicate polio from the world, building boreholes for underprivileged communities, aiding in the fight against poor sanitation, among others. Polio has been one thing that Rotary has identified with over the period. We try as much as possible to eradicate polio the world over. So that is one thing that you always identify Rotary with. But apart from that, we do a lot of projects like boreholes, sanitation. We are very much particular about peace and conflict. You see, and we do all these things such that we as Rotarians will also use it to contribute to our quota to the development of the world over. These activities are in addition to teaching citizens to live morally upright. A report by Mohamed Nuruddin. Now, chiefs and traditional rulers in the Upper East region say they are committed to taking steps to modify old widowhood rights that are injurious and infringe on the fundamental human rights of widows. The chiefs made a commitment after the widows and orphans movement led widows in the Upper East region to issue a communique appealing to the regional house of chiefs to have the dangerous widowhood rights removed. The communique was issued as part of an event to mark the International Widows Day. Correspondent Albert Sorry has more. International Widows Day is marked in June every year to draw attention to the plight of widows all over the world. Widows in the Upper East region marked the day this year with a march through the principal streets of Bolgatanga. They raised placards with various inscriptions drawing the attention of government, traditional authorities and other duty bearers to the problems faced by widows in the Upper East region led by the Widows and Orphans Movement, an NGO based in the Upper East region and working to promote, uphold and protect the rights of widows and orphans, the march ended with a brief program where the widows discussed matters that affect them. Fatih Abigail Abdullahi is director of the Widows and Orphans Movement. The Ghana Household Registry um, in 2018 did a survey that showed that 61% of widows that are employable are actually unemployed. Again, the same survey says that three out of four widows in the Upper East region are either poor or extremely uh, poor. Um, the Widows and Orphans Movement over the years, uh, based on the work we've done, um, evidence shows that most of these um, poverty situations the women face is based on the widowhood rights and practices that they go through which are injurious to them. Um, so for instance, we still have widowhood rights where they say that a widow shouldn't um, consume the foodstuffs that were uh, she owned uh, after the funeral and these foodstuffs are shared to other family members. After this funeral, we realize that these widows and their children struggle to survive. And so it is on this basis that this year our theme is looking at sustainable solutions to ending widowhood rights. The widows issued and presented a communique to the Upper East Regional House of Chiefs appealing for the abolishment of traditional widowhood rights that are injurious to widows and violate their fundamental human rights. Traumatized and 
losing their, their self-confidence for the right of their lives. The Widows Network is calling on the Regional House of Chiefs and the Upper East, Region, Upper East Regional Minister to modify and or abolish the following. Contact sacrifice using powers on objects and not on the head of widows. Abolish all rights and practice that involve widows and children consuming all hygienic food and concoction. Stop placing disease, little brothers, cause on the lives of firstborn children to prevent the transfer of Receiving the communique on behalf of the Upper East Regional House of Chiefs, the Paramount Chief of the Nangodi Traditional Area, Nap Pariyong Kosum Asaga Yelizoya II, said he believed the House of Chiefs would seriously consider taking steps to modify and, where necessary, remove entirely the outmoded customary widowhood rights. For Joy News, Albert Sorry, reporting from Bolgatanga. Before we take a break, we move to the Ashanti region now and motorists plying the road leading to the Ashanti Regional Coordinating Council are calling on authorities to prune overgrown weeds creeping onto the road. Drivers say it has become dangerous negotiating the sharp curve on the road located in the Denyami residential area as portions of it are covered with weeds. Pedestrians and motorists who ply the stretch say it is risky using the route, especially at night. Love FM's Emmanuel Bright Quayquay interacted with some road users and has filed this report. Weeds along the sharp curve have crept onto the road, narrowing the already slender route. Drivers who ply the stretch describe the area as a breeding ground of fatal road accidents. Eja Menu, a commercial driver, recounts a near rear on collision with an oncoming vehicle. It was raining, and because we usually use bright lights during such times, I nearly crashed into an oncoming vehicle because I couldn't see it coming. The stretch joins the main route to the Ashanti Regional Coordinating Council and the presidential residency from Denyame. Commercial drivers in the residential area tell Love News it's precarious negotiating the bend at night, especially for persons who are unacquainted of the road. It's scary using the road at night, especially for weeder drivers. Because of the bush, it's really dangerous using the road. This guardrail that is meant to protect pedestrians that ply the stretch and also as an indication for oncoming vehicles that this is a sharp curve is now covered in weeds. It makes it difficult for drivers who use this stretch to go to the other side and even those coming from the other end to know whether they are directly inside the curve. The speed ramp signage engulfed in the bush is not only elusive to drivers, but its complementary structure, meant to slow down speeding vehicles, has lost its navigation to the road. The section covered by weeds, we are told, was demarcated for construction of a pedestrian walkway. But pedestrians have to alternatively use the more perilous side of the road. Oh, bah. We have no space to walk by the road unless we walk inside of the road. It car nearly knocked me down whilst I was walking. When, when the car is coming, it's very difficult for you to, to I mean, give, give way for the car to pass. The stretch leading to Golden Tulip Hotel from the Regional Lands Commission office is no different. So you can imagine the difficulty pedestrians and drivers have to endure during the night using the stretch. Until the weeds along the roads are pruned, they could potentially cost a life. For Joy News, Imano Bright Kweku reporting. My name is Muhammad.
Welcome back from the break. The Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Samuel Abujinapo, has rebutted the allegation that government is using money from the PIT Redevelopment Fund to finance the National Cathedral Project. The minister says it is completely outrageous for anybody to make such suggestions. The sector minister was speaking during a visit to the temporary settlement for affected residents of Apiati disaster. In Nathalia, Kwanza has the rest of the story. This is the whole master plan. Mm. Excellent. Yeah. And the idea is to be able to build this eventually. Mm. But really... Speaking during an inspection of preparatory works at the original PRT community to pave way for construction, he expressed satisfaction with the work done so far on the redevelopment process. Samuel Abujinapo, accompanied by his deputy, Benito Usubio, who is leading the Apiate project, had a symbolic demolition of things used by the affected persons, indicating an end to the use of things by the affected residents following their relocation into the future global resources temporal settlement site. I, I, I came here uh, to satisfy myself the conditions under which the victims of the tragic APAT disaster are, are, are living in and um, the conditions as I've seen are reasonably satisfactory and, and far, far better than the vulnerable state in which they found themselves in these tents. And as you can see, we have symbolically dismantled one of the tents which uh, begins the dismantling of all the tents here and of course we we've been able to uh, provide them with temporary structures which are reasonably fit for purpose and i've spoken to some of the victims and the occupants of these structures and they seem to be quite happy with the arrangements we've put in place uh, secondly i've been to the construction site and uh, by that I mean the original APAT township or community or settlement. And indeed, uh, I am happy to report that considerable work is being done under the able leadership of my deputy, Honorable Benito Usubio and his team. And, and I must commend them highly. They've done such a yeoman's uh, job and they, they've done such detailed, diligent work. And we are now at the stage where the construction um, is going to begin uh, in the not too distant future. And uh, we are determined to reconstruct the community into a model, modern Ghanaian uh, rural community, uh, which is uh, uh, fit for purpose and which will uh, be an example for other developments across the country. The sector minister, however, says government is yet to raise the needed fund to build the Apiate community, which was destroyed by explosive on January 20, 2022, and thus appeal to Guineans to continue to donate to the Apiate Redevelopment Fund. Yeah, there, there's a clear distinction. The matters to do with uh, welfare, local welfare issues are being handled competently and efficiently by the municipal chief executive and i should commend the municipal chief executive he's, just, he's done such an extraordinary work here and i think that he's very much on top of all those issues and he's dealing with them as they arise the matter that i i sought to debunk is the usual political propaganda for cheap parochial political interest and which is that the funds which have been contributed or raised for the construction of the community is being used for the construction of the National Cathedral. It's, it's completely outrageous for anybody to suggest that, and, and that is palpably uh, untrue. All the expenses and management of the fund under the leadership of Madame Joyce, i.e. a woman of enormous integrity, is being done very transparently and above board. And, and when all is said and done, the Ghanaian people and the people of APAT will come to the firm conclusion that every penny is being spent and spent properly and transparently with integrity. And of course, let me conclude by continuously calling on Ghanaians and well-wishers to contribute to the fund because what we require to rebuild 
the community will still not been able to raise uh, the requisite uh, funds which will, will be needed to rebuild the community. So we, we call on Ghanaian. The lands minister personally donated food items as well as 10,000 Ghana cities to the residents. For Joy News in Athalia Kwansa, Apiate. We head to the Upper West region now and the Vice Chancellor of the Simon Diegdong Dombos University, Professor Philip Dukuose, has underscored the importance of monitoring and evaluation in the country's quest for development. Professor Duku Osei, speaking at the launch of the Young Impact Associate Program in WA, posited that the monitoring and evaluation in the public sector is of utmost importance to the president, hinting that cabinet was on the verge of passing it into a policy that will be the guiding principle for conducting monitoring and evaluation in the country. Joy News' Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafik Salam reports from WA. The Young Impact Associates YIA program is an initiative under the MasterCard Young Africa Work Strategy aimed at giving young people practical and theoretical training on monitoring and evaluation to make them competitive in the job market in Africa and beyond in order for them to have a dignified life. The Simon D. Dondombo University of Business and Integrated Development Studies, SDDU Bates, went into partnership with participatory development associates PDA and Mobile Web Ghana to equip these young associates with unique monitoring and evaluation techniques with particular focus on indigenous African-led evaluation techniques. Dr. Frederick Dayur is the SDDU based coordinator for the YIA and he shed light on the selection process of the 100 students that were trimmed down to 13. We're looking at uh, ages of 18 to 35 and that's actually the how do you call it? The youth, Ghana Youth Policy prescribes uh, that age range for young people. So we went by that. And so some were dropped again. Then we went through uh, an online selection process where they were interviewed. From there, they went through uh, a face-to-face -face, uh, selection process, which was done in Accra. They wrote an exam as well. So it was quite a rigorous process. And we empaneled five uh, panelists who did the selection and we came to 18 of them who are now Young Impact Associates for the program for 2022. Vice Chancellor of SDD UBITS, Professor Philip Dukuosai, at the launch of the program underscored the importance of monitoring and evaluation in the country's quest for development. The cabinet is just about to pass into a policy that will be the guiding principle for conducting M&E in Ghana. We have also tried to shift the base for doing M&E in the public sector by moving it from the office of the president to a ministry for monitoring and evaluation and back to the office of the president. M&E in the public sector is of utmost importance to the president. The reason why he has caused this movement back to where he can visibly see the actions that are taking place. Impact Lead Mastercard Foundation, Maryland and he was stated that the program is being rolled out in seven other African countries and urged the young passengers to make good use of the opportunity given them. The Young Africa Works strategy is to enable 30 million young women and men in Africa to secure dignified and fulfilling employment. In order to achieve, and in order to achieve this goal, the foundation will do the following. We are designing country-specific strategies. We are hoping to empower young women. We want to work with African organizations. We want to use technology to drive impact and scale, and finally to share evidence-based knowledge and innovation. Some of the young associates share their thoughts with Joy News. But uh, coming here, and then throughout the process, I realized that it, it's a very great program, and then it is something that I love to do. And um, with my passion and interest in research, I developed that from uh, my national service with Institute of Statistical Social and Economic Research, University of Ghana. And so when I saw this opportunity, I was like, wow, this is a great one. And then to broaden my research knowledge, yes, so I took up this opportunity. 
considering the fact that I have had my attempts to join a consultancy firm turned down because I have no knowledge in monitoring and evaluation. So when I had this notice, the advert on monitoring evaluation project carried out here, I slot in my application and I was very happy because I believe at the end of the day I will be equipped with the necessary skills and expertise to carry out monitoring evaluation exercises within the continent at large. Reporting for J News, Rafik Salam. Wa the Legal Aid Commission has trained new recruits on providing efficient and effective services in alternative dispute resolution. The administrative staff will act as administrators and mediators in the various legal aid offices across the country. The new recruits receive the training in ADR approaches, professional mediation strategies, community mediation tactics, administrative commission procedures, and other topics at a workshop in Kumasi. As much as possible to do a lot of advocacy on legal aid, we as an organization try in all the ways that we can to ensure that people who do not know about legal aid and the fact that there are services available to provide that free legal services to people to know about it and come. And this particular program is not necessarily about creating awareness of legal aid, but then to train the new staff that have been employed. Because for them to be able to grant free legal aid, for them to be able to ensure that there is access to justice, the people must be well trained, must be well equipped, which is the staff. So today's meeting is particularly about ensuring that the staff of legal aid are well equipped to do the work that they are mandated to do. The initiatives are being carried out across the country. In as much as we are ensuring the use of ADR mechanisms in resolving cases, we are also particular about the case tracking system. And Legal Aid Commission is one of the organizations that have been put into the legal uh, the case tracking system. They are part of the social justice sector institutions that must utilize the case tracking system. So we needed to mention it for them to know, for those that do not know that Legal aid is part of the sex justice sector institution that must utilize CTS. I needed to let them know that is how come we highlighted on the case tracking system, though it is an ADR training. So how services is free. You don't pay anything. There's, you should do it to pay As soon as they hear legal, legal, they think money is involved. Everything, of, everything related to lawyer money. So they think hear legal, legal money. So we are being dedicated on radio and TV, but we shall still go on. We have to press it. The problem must be trying ourselves. Any time they hear of legal aid, it shouldn't be free. You can go just go in for free advice. Not necessarily when you have a problem. Go there. If something is nagging you about either constitution or the law or something you want to know, go there. Lawyers are there and free. They will help you. Just to give you free ad advice. Not go necessarily there's an issue between you and another person. If there's something bothering you, you can just go there, sit down in your comfort, ask questions you want to know about the law. They will, give, they, will give, they will respond to you. Ghana, please tell us to the Ghana. Brita also observes some obstacles impeding the work of the Legal Aid Commission, such as inadequate laptops and bad internet connectivity. She appeals to charitable groups and individuals to help the Commission provide its services in an effective and efficient manner. Some of the challenges we face yeah, internet connectivity. Most of the police stations and then the judicial service, they complain about internet connectivity. Some complain about the fact that they do not even have um, laptops and computers to work with. And we try so much to provide them with some of this equipment. So I think this is even a call on the public and then other funders to come together to provide all these materials that are needed to ensure the effective use of the case tracking system at the sex justice sector institutions. The alternative dispute resolution is to avoid court litigation. The new staff are expected to provide efficient and effective services in alternative dispute resolution. A report by Mohamed Nuruddin. To the northeast region now, and scores of people have been displaced in Walwale in the northeast region following the destruction of their buildings and other properties in a demolition exercise by the municipal assembly. 
According to the assembly, the demolition exercise is to pave the way for the start of the second phase of the Walawale Township Road project. Some of the affected property owners who now live with family relatives told Joy News that the assembly failed to give them adequate notice and a dialogue opportunity for possible compensation before carrying out the exercise. The assembly has, however, denied the allegation, insisting that only illegal structures were cleared. There is more in this report. Since the beginning of last month, the West Mamprosi Municipal Assembly has been carrying out a mass demolition exercise in the municipal capital, Wali Wali. The exercise, according to the Assembly authorities, is to clear the way for the commencement of Phase 2 of the Wali Wali Township Rules Expansion Project. Areas affected by the exercise include Fonni, Nayilifon, Kukwazugu, and Mosifon where dozens of houses and other structures, including stores, have been demolished, causing a mass displacement of the residents there. At Mosifon, where the exercise was underway, residents looked on helplessly as their buildings were being raised down. Already, the residents were still battling with the destruction of their properties by a severe rainstorm that swept through the town a few weeks ago. Speaking to Joy News, the victims recounted their losses and call for the assistance of the government. Those three houses being destroyed over there are mine. Thirteen rooms, all gone. We have been rendered homeless and displaced by that. My major concern, however, is that this is happening during the rainy season. We are happy that they want to construct the road, but they also have to come to our aid to accommodate us. They are destroying us. We don't know where we are sleeping. We just need a help for them to find a place and sleep. That is our problem. We are pleading for them. Yes, I'm now come on. We are pleading for assistance because my children and I are homeless now. I do not know where to accommodate my kids. We haven't been given any compensation. This woman is pointing at her two bedroom house, which was being pulled down. She is now displaced alongside her six children. I built this house two years ago with all my resources. Now that it has been destroyed, I have nowhere to go, and my children too tell the government to come to our aid. The exercise also affected a popular Arabic school in the area. This little girl could not hold it as she watched her school being damaged by heavy machinery. Amadou Azara also claimed to have lost a bedroom and her metal made store. She said they were hardly given enough notice of the exercise and criticized the assembly's decision not to pay compensations for the destruction of their properties. They didn't give us any notice. We woke up three days ago to see this happening here. I haven't slept for three days today and I haven't been able to do my business because my store has been damaged. Please kindly have mercy on us and come to our aid. The exercise, according to the municipal assembly, is part of the assembly's goal to position Wale Wale as the central business hub of the northeast region. Speaking to Joy News, the municipal chief executive Arimiya Osomolaki refuted the residents' claims, insisting that only illegal structures were affected. This particular project does not have compensation. The second thing is that we don't also deliberately want to destroy properties that are legally footed. If you see that a property is taken off, it means that the person, the, either the property is illegally kept there or it's legally, I mean, the, the person deliberately put the, uh, the, 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 the structure on the road. But all the structures that have been demolished, I can say without any contradiction, none of them even have a permit. Mm. They never even came to the assembly to request for that. The MC said despite the concerns of the residents, the exercise had been successfully and thanked the people of Wale Wale for the warm cooperation. But I want to thank the good people of Wale Wale. The support that they have given me as chief executive for this exercise, I can't thank them enough. They have been very cooperative. And let me tell you, my biological uncle, house even got affected. 
So, in that scenario, I have to praise the good people of Wali Wali. Because they want to take the development into their own hands. Those few ones who still feel they are not satisfied should come to my office. Then we'll sit down, we'll look at it and go. But this particular exercise, there's no retreat and I will not surrender. From Wali Wali, Ilya Sutanko reporting for Joy News. The Youth Challenge International, through the Head Start program, is set to train and offer business services to about 10,000 young women across the country, Tanzania and Uganda. The intervention is to help improve the economic well-being of these women who have been described as marginalized. The intervention will increase their access to economic opportunities and resources which are expected to help shape their own future. Martina Bugri has more in this report. The Youth Challenge International Hair Start Program aims to build an enabling environment for social innovation and women's social enterprise development. Over the seven years period, the Youth Challenge International and Global Affairs Canada will invest six million Canadian dollars and the capacity of 135 volunteers to support women in Ghana. Speaking at the Catalyst Fan Award Ceremony to honor 10 girls, the country project lead Osmond Wisdom Kwanza said YCI is partnering government to address the gender inequality gap and youth unemployment. Help us innovate the future is an initiative designed by Youth Challenge International in partnership with leading local organizations, NOSAC, and Boga Technical, Boga Terminal Technical University, with the goal to foster and create innovative solutions for a more equitable and prosperous economy within Ghana, Tanzania, and Uganda. YCI has an aid to build an enabling environment for social innovation and women's social enterprise development while increasing awareness of and support for social ventures. The theme for this event is women economic empowerment through social entrepreneurship. YCI utilizes an economic empowerment approach as an entry point to addressing gender-based violence, protecting women's human rights, and promoting leadership among young women. The Northern Regional Minister, Shani al hassan Shaibu, said the initiative has come at the right time and urged the beneficiaries to put to good use the money given them. It's really a great initiative, and I would like to applaud the youth Challenge International for the production of such a real challenge, a, a real change for women starts women's rights starts with women themselves. And it can only be meaningful and sustainable if they are women leaders. Empowerment of women entrepreneurs is an innovative success mantra for the development of the Ghanaian economy. Let me use this opportunity to say a big congratulations to all those who have been chosen. My word of advice for this is to judicious use of the funds that will be given to you. And that's our show for today. Many thanks for watching. My name is Richard Kujinyakun. I'll come your way same time next week. Until then, have a beautiful day.